Friends, this case is sickening, full of rage, full of hate, and yes, stupid. We start in 1996. New York officer, Freeman, turned his car onto Madison Street. Something caught his attention, right at the river's edge, at the far end of a parking lot. Freeman spotted two cars, both with their trunks open. He pulled to a stop and watched as a man in a t-shirt and what appeared to be from a distance to be a single glove on his right hand. The man grabbed a large black trash bag from the trunk of one of the cars. He then grabbed another. He made his way to the river's edge and tossed in one of the bags. As the police officer eased closer, the man froze. He was alone, but there were two cars next to him. For the first time, he noticed splashes of brownish red on the man's pants and shoes. The glove the police officer Freeman had spotted from a few yards away, a surgical glove was also splattered with what appeared to be blood. Then Freeman noticed the sickly sweet stench, a smell he recognized as drying blood. He looked down at the bag that remained on the ground. Inspection of the bag turned up a set of bloody tools, a hacksaw, a pair of axes, knives and a scalpel. In the other bag were clothes, all of them drenched in blood, but that wasn't the worst of it. In the trunk of the two cars, there were eight other bags. One contained blood-soaked clothing, the others contained the earthly remains of Yakov Glusman. He was a 48-year-old millionaire scientist who had spent most of his life trying to find a cure for cancer. His body had been hacked to pieces, 65 pieces to be precise. In fact, he had been dismembered so thoroughly that even his nose and his lips had been removed. At that moment, as Freeman waited with the silent Russian man with the bloodstained pants, the only thing the cop knew for certain was that his Easter shift had suddenly become a lot less peaceful. The Russian man's name was Vladimir Zelenin. It was hard for police to interrogate him as he spoke very little English. The victim, he explained, was in fact Yakov Glusman. He also managed to explain that Rita Glusman was his cousin and that she had been instrumental in helping him emigrate to the United States 11 months earlier. The cops, of course, had never heard of the victim, Yakov Glusman, or his wife, Rita. In terms of their background, Yakov and Rita had met when they were in elementary school in the Soviet Union in 1977, before they moved to America. Those first years in America were, by all accounts, a happy time for the Glusman family. Yakov had found what was for a microbiologist a dream job. He was hired by the prestigious laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island, where he worked as a senior scientist on a research team headed by Dr. James Watson. The Nobel Prize winning biologist who together with Francis Crick discovered the molecular structure of DNA. This, by all accounts, a happy marriage. But the question remains, what went wrong? How did he end up in a trash bag in pieces? You see, in 1994, things between Yakov and Rita had deteriorated beyond repair. They seemed to be on different trajectories. Yakov was growing as a cancer researcher whilst Rita's technology company was going bankrupt. By the fall of 1994, Yakov had made up his mind. In a telephone conversation with his father, he confessed that his 25-year marriage to Rita was on the rocks. A short time later, Yakov told Rita that he wanted a divorce. She was, in her own words, devastated, and when he filed for divorce, he blamed his wife for mental cruelty. Rita was becoming desperate, and some say her behavior had become erratic. She had burned through $90,000 that Yakov had given her when he had moved out a year earlier, and yet she found it impossible to control her cravings for luxuries, large and small. Imagine that. Imagine your partner leaves you and he still gives you 90 grand. Wow. It was a measure of just how desperate she had become. She was arrested after pocketing some small items at a North Jersey pharmacy and was charged with shoplifting. Her business was continuing to suffer. The divorce was becoming even more acrimonious as the couple traded escalating charges and counter charges. It's not clear exactly when Rita 
hit on the plan, but by early March 1996, she had apparently made up her mind and was ready to enlist her cousin Zelenin. Her plan was as simple as it was brutal. In the months leading up to Easter, Rista managed to get a key to her estranged husband's apartment. She had persuaded him to give it to her during one of those lulls in combat and had it copied. She knew her ex-husband's schedule and knew that he often spent Saturday evening at the lab and generally got home at 11.30pm. Her cousin, Zelenin, she knew had an axe that he kept in his home. She managed to get her hands on one too and packed the other tools they needed. This was a hacksaw, a scalpel, a knife and lots and lots of cleaning products. On the night of April the 6th, 1994, a few hours before Yakov was scheduled to return home, Rita and Zelenin drove from Bergen County in a late model Ford Taurus that had been registered to her company. They drove across the New York state line, headed down the Palisades Parkway and pulled off onto the Pearl River exit. They parked in a shadowy spot some distance from the front door of Yakov Glusman's apartment. They stood in silence in the living room and they waited. At 11.30pm, Yakov eased his Nissan Maxima into his parking spot and went into his apartment. There, Zelenin struck the first blow. He told the investigators, in the darkness, he couldn't tell precisely where he struck Glusman, but the 48-year-old scientist crumpled to the floor. Then Rita hacked the man with such rage and vicious force that at one point her axe slipped and struck Zelenin on the right hand. This silly cow went to strike her husband so hard that she struck both of them. Wow! Luckily for Zelenin, it wasn't a serious wound, but it did bleed. Still, Rita insisted that they had no time to spare and would deal with Zelenin's wound later. Taking the knife from the bag, she plunged it into her ex-husband's chest just to make sure. Zelenin told investigators they dragged his bloody corpse into the bathroom where they had the body to bits. Rita was so adamant that there'd be no piece of the man large enough to be identified. They cut off his fingertips to prevent fingerprint identification and even removed his nose and lips so no one would might find the body would ever recognize him. As Zelenin continued the task of butchering the body, Rita went into a cleaning frenzy, trying to make sure that there would be no evidence of the crime. Only one neighbor, Kathy Armstrong, who lived a floor below Glusman, heard anything at all. Some thumping and banging at around 3am on Easter and she thought nothing of it. What they were actually moving was what remained of Glusman. His body parts and bloody clothing had been stuffed into black plastic garbage bags, nine of them. The tools they had used to dismember him were stuffed into another bag. Then the bags were loaded into the trunks of the two cars. According to the plan, they would drive 30 miles to East Rutherford in the two cars, Zelenin in the Taurus, Rita in the Maxima. Then Zelenin would drive Rita back home in her dead husband's Nissan and they would leave the Taurus in her company's parking lot. Zelenin would then return to East Rutherford, dump Glusman's remains in the Pasik River and then dispose of the car before sunrise. But there was a hitch. They were off schedule. While loading one of the cars, Zelenin, it seemed, had accidentally triggered its theft alarm. It was only a brief wail in the night, and if anyone in the apartment complex heard the alarm, they didn't bother to investigate. All the same, Rita panicked, hopped into the Taurus and ordered Zelenin to speed away. He cruised the neighborhood for some time before they ventured back to the apartment complex, realized the coast was clear and resumed their grim work. What's more, it had taken longer to dismember Yakov and to clean his apartment than Rita had originally estimated. The schedule was also thrown off by the fact that they had to do something about the wound on Zelenin's hand. Remember, this silly cow whacked her husband so hard that she even hurt her cousin. As they made their way south, Zelenin and the widow, Rita, stopped at a CVS pharmacy in the town of Fair Lawn. And as a surveillance camera recorded the moment, she bought $32 worth of bandages. By the time authorities in Bergen County reached Glusman's home, 
The next day, Rita was already gone. So was her passport, sparking fears among prosecutors that perhaps she had fled overseas, maybe to Israel, or Switzerland, or England, all the countries where she had friends. But it turned out, as Zelenin was being held in Bergen County, Rita was driving east in her car, heading across the George Washington Bridge, bound for Long Island. It was clear that she expected authorities to be looking for her. Along the way, she stopped briefly in Amityville and stole a set of New York license plates from a parked car so that her car with its New Jersey tags wouldn't be so obvious. Although investigators in both jurisdictions had not yet publicly declared Rita a suspect in the death of her husband, there no one doubted she had planned the slaying, participated in it and was now fleeing from police. They issued a public alert for her, saying they just wanted to talk with her. But what might have seemed like an open and shut murder case was far from it. Investigators who had combed through Yakov Glusman's Pearl River apartment had found a few odd traces of forensic evidence, but it had not yet been tested, and even once it was, there was no guarantee that the evidence would incriminate Rita. After all, it had been Zelenin who had been wounded in the attack. There was a good chance that when the tests were completed, the only thing they'd be able to prove was that Zelenin had been present at the apartment during the murder. Even if they could find a stray fingerprint from Rita, the cops knew that a smart defense attorney could explain it away, saying it could have been left there during one of the periodic arguments in the chilly relationship between the couple. So at this stage, all police had was Zelenin's confession. But even that was problematic as under New York state law, a murder case cannot be based on the testimony of an accomplice unless there are other witnesses or other compelling evidence. There were no other witnesses and at that moment there really wasn't any other compelling evidence. But on Friday April 12th, just a few moments before noon, Rita was holed up in the tiny bungalow when a cleaning woman making her routine rounds surprised her. Once again, Rita tried to flee, scrambling out a back window and onto the grounds of the sprawling laboratory, leaving behind her passport and several travel brochures, including some for Switzerland. This is when the cleaning woman notified police. And keep in mind, the local police, of course, had no idea who Rita was. They had not received any of the alerts that had been issued in New Jersey and Rockland County. They might simply have charged her with burglary or perhaps just cited her for trespassing. Eventually, local police managed to snatch her and arrest her. The day after her arrest and again a few days later, prosecutors successfully fended off her attorney, Michael Rosen's efforts to win bail for his client. He said, we both know this is not just a normal burglary. Nassau County Judge Claire Weinberg told Rosen, the possibility of murder charges is in the background. As far as Rosen was concerned, time was on his side. You see, under New York state law, the judge's decision to reject bail had cleared the way for Rosen to file what is known as a felony examination. The move gave prosecutors 48 hours to provide the court with evidence that Rita was dangerous enough, that her crime had been serious enough, and that she was enough of a risk of flight to justify being held without bail. And it was evidence that the prosecutors did not have. In essence, Rosen had called the prosecutor's bluff. Two days later, after posting a bond to cover her $250,000 bail, Rita walked out of the Nassau County Jail with Rosen at her side. Rosen himself was ecstatic. Sure, there was still a good chance that Rita would face state charges in connection with Yakov's death, but it would probably only be a charge of accessory to murder. For a guy like Rosen, who had made his name representing accused mobsters, that was hardly a daunting challenge. There were many ways he could deal with that when the time came. For now, however, Rosen wanted to relish his victory. Just then, he said, his cell phone rang. It was George Gabriel, a special agent for the FBI, whom Rosen knew pretty well, having dealt with him in a half dozen or so organized crime cases. Mike, he said, I hate to do this to you, but you better make a U-turn. It was like a bullet between the eyes, Rosen would later say. The FBI agent had instructed Rosen to bring his client to the US Federal Court building in White Plains, New York. On the 40-minute ride north to White Plains, Rosen tried to figure out what was happening. 
The feds couldn't be planning to charge her with murder, he thought. That's a state crime. The federal government had no jurisdiction. It would certainly be too much of a stretch, even for ambitious federal prosecutors, to think that they could twist the federal racketeering statutes to cover the case. What did they have up their sleeve? Rosen wondered. When he reached the modern steel and marble federal courthouse in White Plains, he found out. While he had been busy fighting to win bail for Rita, local authorities had been huddling with federal prosecutors and had come up with a unique way to prosecute her for her role in her husband's death. In a four-page complaint, federal prosecutors charged her under the 1994 Domestic Violence Statute, a law properly known as the Violence Against Women Act. It was a daring maneuver. The law, which allows the federal government to get involved when a person crosses state lines to commit an act of domestic violence, had been used only a few times and never against a woman. But it provided the authorities with the clout they needed to prosecute Rita. Specifically, it gave authorities the right to use Zelenin's testimony freely. They had already worked out a deal with the 40-year-old Russian immigrant in exchange for a lenient sentence and a pledge that his two teenage sons, both Russian-born, would be allowed to remain in the country while he was in jail. He also provided a sentence that local and federal prosecutors could live with. Instead of facing a maximum of 15 years in prison, the best state prosecutors could have hoped for if they had been able to build a case, the federal domestic violence statute sets a penalty of life without parole when domestic violence turns deadly. On April the 30th, 1997, a little more than a year after Yakov died, Rita stood before the US District Court Judge Barrington Parker. She said, I did not do it and I still say that in front of the world. But the judge was unmoved. A jury convinced by Zelenin's testimony had found that Rita and her cousin had ambushed her husband as he walked into his Pearl River apartment. Then they hacked him into 65 pieces and that they planned to dump his body in the river so he would vanish completely. You were a woman of considerable courage and capacity, the judge said, as he looked down from the bench at the weeping defendant. For whatever reasons, you allowed yourself to disintegrate around the relationship and the pain that grew out of that relationship. None of us can really know what happened between you and your husband. He went on to say, the only thing we can know with any certainty is that nothing can justify what you did to him. With that, the judge handed down his sentence. The woman, who a generation earlier had been the poster child for the campaign to bring freedom to an entire class of people in the Soviet Union, would spend the rest of her life behind bars in her adopted home. However, in 2020, she was released from prison. Compassionate release was granted after Rita experienced several medical issues, including multiple strokes and a diagnosis of early Parkinson's disease. According to the conditions of her supervised release, Rita would be confined to her home with a few exceptions and will have to wear a GPS monitoring device. And the last anyone checked, she was being cared for by her sister. You know, I'm never going to understand the decisions humans make, but imagine that. Her husband divorced her, they didn't get along, fine, it happens, it happens every day. He still gave you so much money, what did you spend it on? Louis Vuitton purses, getting your hair done? Love, he gave you everything and you threw it in his face. Then she cut him up to 65 pieces. Why did you hate this man so much? Who knows, silly cow. Either way, should she be released? I don't know, why don't you guys comment, tell me what you think. The federal women's prison at Fort Worth is where Rita Guzman spent nearly two decades. A year after her husband Yakov moved out of their New Jersey home and started dating a new woman, court documents say Guzman approached her cousin about murdering him. Guzman's been in federal custody for nearly 25 years until her compassionate release on Tuesday. This process is set aside from what happened at the trial. Roberto Cañas is a former trial judge. He spoke about what is considered as a judge weighs compassionate release. You want to be able to look at this today's situation, what her needs are, and what does fairness and justice dictate today and judge if they do need and do have a legitimate compassionate um, reason to be released. And apparently the judge was convinced that she does. The judge granted the release due to her declining health. Luzman suffered from multiple strokes and has early Parkinson's disease. 
She has trouble standing and walking, relying on a walker or wheelchair to move around. She wrote the court saying in part, I am writing to ask you to give me a second chance so that I do not have to die in prison. But Yakov's brother also wrote a letter saying he was horrified about her release, adding, I am convinced that if she is released, I would live out my life in fear for myself and my children. Still, a judge allowed her to get out. After flying out of DFW Tuesday, records say she's staying Wednesday at a hotel in New Jersey before returning home to begin her supervised release in Fort Worth. I'm Alex Rosier.